Well, good evening and welcome everyone to the 2019 Mark Kennedy Frontiers and Freedom Lecture Series. My name is Matt Lindstrom and I have the privilege of serving as the Edward Henry Professor of Political Science as well as the director of the Eugene J. McCarthy Center for Public Policy and Civic Engagement. Thank you all for joining us for this exciting evening. The McCarthy Center, for those of you that don't know, offers a variety of resources and opportunities for students in the wider community and provides venues for constructive dialogue and debate on social, political, and economic issues. And last year, we were pleased to facilitate a bipartisan, student-led voter coalition that led to significant increases in campus voting in the 2018 elections. These campus voting increases, in fact, were recently recognized by a national organization called Civic Nation. And both campuses received the Platinum Award for over 50% voter turnout. Even better, the College of St. Benedict received a National Champion Award for the largest increase in undergraduate campus voting in the country. In fact, here we go, this is it. So kudos to you students, right? <laughs> National champion. What is that? I'm going to set that right there. Um, I'm also very pleased to announce tonight that eight-year president of Columbia, 2016 Nobel Peace Prize winner, President Juan Santos will be on campus in February for the annual Eugene J. McCarthy Lecture. And tonight, together with our co-sponsors from Benny's in Business Student Club, Black Students Association, the JEC, I Lead, the McNeely Center for Entrepreneurship, and the John and Elizabeth Myers Chair in Management, and finally the Sister Nancy Hines Institute for Women's Leadership. All join the McCarthy Center in welcoming Lauren Simmons on campus for the Mark Kennedy Frontiers and Freedom Lecture Series. For those of you that don't know Mark Kennedy, real briefly, uh, he is a graduate of St. John's. He's a former, board, uh, former member of Congress and uh, CEO of a number of, or a corporate executive, a number of uh, Fortune 500 companies, and now he's the president of the University of Colorado. Unfortunately, he's not able to join us tonight, but he sends these words, quote, Lauren Simmons is the perfect fit for the spirit and substance of this lecture series. She furthers the cause of freedom and is a pioneer in her field. After Lauren's lecture, we will have a discussion right over here, with several students. First of all, Diamond Rover, a communications major from Las Vegas, Nevada. Madeline Nelson, a global business major from Eden Prairie, Minnesota. John Taylor, peace studies major from Los Angeles, California, as well as Professor Margaret Newhouse, the John and Elizabeth Myers Chair in Management here at St. Ben St. John's. In conclusion, I'd like to call up Skylar Gast to the stage so she can introduce Lauren Simmons. Skylar is one of our fabulous McCarthy Center coordinators. She's an accounting and finance major, an award-winning mock trial participant, and comes to us from Shawona, Wisconsin. Thank you, Skylar, and welcome to the stage. Good evening, everyone. I'm grateful to be with you all tonight to introduce Lauren Simmons. Lauren Simmons is a graduate from, graduate from Kennesaw State University with a bachelor degree in genetics and a minor in statistics. After her graduation in 2016, Lauren Simmons moved to New York City and by networking she found herself with an opportunity to work on the New York Stock Exchange as an equity trader. After passing the exams needed to become a trader at the age of 23, Lauren Simmons made history by being the youngest and only full-time female equity trader on, the Wall, on Wall Street and the second African-American woman to work at the New York Stock Exchange in its 225-year history. Her incredible story of owning her own worth is the subject of an up, um, upcoming feature film. The title of tonight's talk is The Power of Being the Other in the Room. It illustrates Lauren's, Lauren's capacity at the empowering leader who inspires all, to, all of us to be confident, fearless, and lim limitless. It's my honor to welcome Lauren Simmons to the stage. Hello. Thank you guys for joining. And I love that you guys showed up. It's a Monday night, it's cold, and you guys 
have other places to be, I'm sure. So I'm so honored uh, that you guys came out tonight. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> I am everything on paper that doesn't make sense. I am Southern. I am a woman. I did not get a degree in finance. I am black, and I did not go to an Ivy League. And yet, despite all those things, I made history as being the other in the room. I became the youngest, only, second African-American female trader at the New York Stock Exchange in 226 years. My journey to Wall Street was interesting. But before I get there, I want to say that when I was invited to come speak at St. John, there was a bit of hesitation. I remember doing my due diligence and reading on St. John and thinking, an all white male private school. <laughs> I, since leaving the trading floor, have had the opportunity to explore and get invited to many different places, such as Beijing, where I was keynote speaker and spoke in a room in front of 500 executive Chinese men, with me being the only woman in the room and being a woman of color. Moments like those are greatly humbling and somehow being invited to Collegeville, Minnesota, two hours away from the nearest city, is something out of a horror movie. <laughs> but regrettably so, I hated that I had that mindset because since I have touched down in Minnesota, you guys have been absolutely wonderful. And I don't mean that just because I'm on stage and I can say it. I genuinely mean that. You guys have been very gracious, very open, and that is something that us humans do. We take a snapshot of perception and based off of fears that we have made up in our mind, we decide that we're not going to do something. I have conditioned myself over the years that if there is something that induces fear in me, especially something that I haven't done before, that I will go out and explore it regardless. And I'm talking about the fear that makes you super nervous your palms are sweating, your heart is ra racing fast, and there are no reasons to be nervous. Case in point, when I was younger, 16, I got my first job as a lifeguard. I had worked a couple summers lifeguarding and eventually got promoted to manager. My first day on the manager rotation, I had a panic attack. I felt that I wasn't prepared, that it was no way that I could manage her. I hadn't been taught what managers were supposed to do. And I told my boss, no. They took me off the rotation, and three months went by, and I hadn't been put back on. So I went up to my boss one day, and I said to her, why <laughs> have I not been put on the manager rotation? And she said to me, because you cried and you had a panic attack and felt that you weren't ready. Two things I learned. One, I would never publicly show somebody that I was scared or afraid because I would not allow them to give me the opportunity to not do something. And two, it was silly. I had been prepared, I had worked at this job for years, I did just fine being a manager. So how did I end up working in a male-dominated space? My journey throughout my life has prepared me to do so. I am from Marietta, Georgia, suburbs of Atlanta. Very southern, grass, white picket fence, 
all those fun southern city things. <laughs> I throughout I was in the IB program when I was in high school and you had to choose which career path you wanted to go by. So I chose architectural engineering. I loved architectural engineering. In my 4 years of high school, that is what I studied. I was the only girl in the class and I loved it. Something about working with all men even to this day, I think there's power in that, it's fun. Um, but certainly working in high school or being in a class and being the only woman, it was exciting. We got to have different conversations. I got to get the male perspective of how they would think, and I learned a lot. Coming towards the end of graduation, I went on to college and I wanted to go into architectural engineering applied for UGA and Georgia Tech with a 3.8, did not get in, <laughs> and ultimately ended up going to Kennesaw. My first two years, I again studied pre-engineering, and I was told my sophomore year that they didn't offer an engineering degree, and so I would have to either transfer schools or change my degree, my major. I went into genetics because I have a brother with cerebral palsy, and for me, I wanted to impact families the way the doctors had impacted mine growing up. At the time, what I wanted to do was to be the change within the genetic space. I wanted to go into genetic counseling. Genetic counseling, I don't know if anybody in this room knows what exactly that is, but in very, very short, uh, you test both parents to see if a child will have a genetic abnormality. I thought, up until I was writing my senior thesis, that we could alter DNA so that a child wouldn't have Down syndrome. It is illegal to alter DNA, and I didn't find this out until I was writing my senior thesis. <laughs> And so my last two years of college weren't, weren't a waste, but while I was getting on stage, December 13, 2016, I knew I was not going to continue on in genetics. If there are any science majors in this room, science research is very boring. <laughs> and it just wasn't anything that I wanted to do. So I graduate. I knew I was gonna go to New York. Why New York? The summer before I graduated, I had gone to New York on a trip, fell in love with New York, and I know it's cliche. After you graduate, go to LA or go to New York. I chose New York, I loved it, and that was the dream. Went to New York, why finance? I needed a job. <laughs> finance ultimately chose me. Through my architectural engineering background and my genetics background, I had a minor in statistics, and I knew that if I was going to put myself out there and speak in front of companies, that was the only thing I could leverage. That did not necessarily mean it would have been finance. That could have been a business analyst. That could have been HR. That could have been psychology. That, that could have been any, any of the above. But through networking, which I had reached out to over 300 people, and why I chose to network instead of just sending out emails on applying for a job was because my mom, she works for Cor Corporate Home Depot, she's senior HR manager, and she would tell me for one job posting that they would get, they would get anywhere between seven and 12,000 applicants. So how do you stand out? It's gonna be being in front of somebody. So I reached out to many different people, and it was interesting because here I was, a girl, just graduating college, sort of kind of knew what I wanted to go into, and I had a lot of the older generation just not understanding why I didn't want to pursue genetics, which was silly. It's a very dated mindset to have, I say that because statistically, only 32% of people go into the major 
go into the career in which they got their degree in. But secondly, if at any point I wanted to change the direction I wanted to go into, I could. I didn't need to answer for anybody. And while I met a lot of di different people, I had many people saying to me, I had no clear direction of where I wanted to go or that I was reaching too high about the opportunities that I was trying to take, which again, didn't make sense. But that's the thing about the older generation. They think, millennials and Gen Zers, we are the generations that want everything instantaneously. And they look at that as a curse. And I look at that as our power. We create billion dollar tech companies in a matter of years. If we want to make something happen, we do it. We're curious, we're open, and we decide if we want something, we do it, and we do it now. While the older generation has this mindset of, you get into a company, you stay in that company, and you work your way to the top. So for me, I was told no a lot. I spoke with a lot of people that were C-suite and above level executives, people that I knew could move mountains to get me into the company. I did not want to talk to entry level associates and I talked to CEOs and I put myself out there and ultimately was introduced to a man who worked at Goldman Sachs. I sat down, I had my five minute spill. I knew at this point that these exploratory conversations that I had, I knew not to ask of anything. That's one thing that people love to do. They love to talk about themselves. And it's very, I don't know what the word is. Uh, mm, I was uncool to ask somebody when you first meet them, can you give me a job? It's almost the same as going on a first date and saying, do you want to marry me? <laughs> so I let him speak. 30 minutes went by. And he says to me, because he, he knew why I was ultimately there, Goldman Sachs is not going to hire you. However, I know a position open on the trading floor as an equity trader. Would you want to apply for the job? Yes. <laughs> I had no question about that. And I didn't care that I didn't didn't have a finance degree. I didn't care about all those things. Honestly, in that moment, I was thinking, I can't wait to get a job. <laughs> I just moved to New York, and I was ready. Now, I graduated December. I didn't receive my job until March 7, which three months went by. And in that time, it seemed like eons. Now, looking back, three months was not a long time at all. After my meeting, I went home, and energetically, I was in a weird place. I, on the one hand, was happy that I was going to be introduced to somebody on the trading floor. On the other hand, I was thinking about the past couple months and how I was supposed to be introduced to a lot of different people and connections that were supposed to be made and weren't. And that's what happens. People will say they will introduce you to somebody and then they ultimately don't or they do it as a favor or they really don't care, et cetera, et cetera. And because I was putting out a weird vibe to the universe, I got a weird vice, weird vibe back from the universe, meaning I left the restaurant, I was on my way onto the subway and my cell phone slips through the platform of the subway onto the floor. I remember going home devastated. I got on my computer, I FaceTimed my mom, and I am crying. I'm saying, I've had made a big mistake. I don't think New York is working out. I don't have $1,000 to buy a new phone. This, this is a wasted plan. My mom stopped me, pulled me to the side, and said, first off, when you move to New York, you gave yourself a year. A year to really fully put yourself out there and to make something happen. It has only been three months. Relax. Secondly, 
why didn't you get a conductor to go grab your phone off the platform? I said, is that a, is that a thing? Long story short, my aunt, who also lives up north, goes to the subway station that I was at, sees my pink phone still sitting on the platform of the, of the um, subway, gets conductor to pick it up, I get my phone, no cracks, no scratches, nothing. But what I did see on my phone was a voicemail from Gordon Charlotte saying, would you please come join us on the trading floor tomorrow morning? I'm not highly religious, but I do believe in having a faith-based system and taking a moment to just relax because everything will be just fine. And my moment of fear, anxiety, the moment I calmed down, the universe had answers for me. The next day, I go onto the trading floor, and it was a magical moment. I went onto the trading floor, everybody's running around, it's all men, it's energetically exciting. I meet Richard Rosenblatt. And people often ask, why did Richard Rosenblatt hire you? Again, you didn't have a finance degree, et cetera, et cetera. He will say, this ballsy girl coming from Georgia who didn't study finance, who is applying for a job that she may or may not be qualified for, still put herself out there? Of course I'm going to say yes to her. If there's one thing about working on the trading floor, that is that everything is done in microseconds. So decisions are made, and you have to commit to those decisions, and you have to be accountable for those decisions. Rosenblatt felt that I was more than qualified to apply for the job and was willing to teach me all that I needed to. Okay, so now I'm on the floor. The job's not completely mine because I had to take the infamous Series 19 exam, which had an 80% fail rate. I wasn't necessarily nervous about the 80% because I'm a pretty optimistic, positive person. I figured 20% of people pass. I could be the 20%. I was more or less nervous that there was a lady who worked for Rosenblatt Securities 10 years, has every FINRA license that you can imagine, had taken it a week before I'd entered the trading floor, and I'd failed the exam. I figured if she can't pass, I have no idea how I'm going to pass. And while the entering class that joined me on the trading floor, it's no secret, nepotism is at its finest on the floor. And so people fail the exam, and there are many students, or students, many of the men who work on the floor whose brother or uncle or father or et cetera, et cetera, magically find these points for them, for them to pass. I knew that that wasn't in my cards. And I was perfectly OK with that. There's one thing of having a victim mentality or feeling like the cards that have been given to you aren't fair. But I'm a true believer that you can create your own reality. You may not be given the same cards that other people have, but if you want something, you want to make it happen, you will make it happen. <laughs> so for me, OK, I knew I had no crutch, and I had to study. The book was about this big. My first month on the floor, I studied the book cover to cover. I don't even think I really spoke to anybody. And I remember when it was time for me to take my exam, right before the, I was scheduled to take my exam, I remember going upstairs, and I remember seeing the men on the floor openly taking bets if I was going to pass or fail. I go upstairs, I come back down, I finish my exam in 45 minutes, which they say is record time, and it's no way she, she passed. It's a lot of whispering going on the floor, and as much as it's a boys club, it's, they gossip like females. And I remember getting slipped a piece of paper, opening it up, pass is all it says. And the floor goes silent. The only things that you could hear were the machines. And I knew in that moment 
I had made my mom proud. That's all I cared about. It wasn't, at the time, I didn't realize that I had made history by becoming the second African-American female or any of the above. I had accomplished something. I moved to New York, passed this test, became an equity trader. My mom was going to be ecstatic. So I call her, she's ecstatic, and now I'm one of the men. But what does that mean? one of the men. Well, they finally took me serious. The men on the floor have very dated mindsets. I love them a lot. Uh, but they believe that it's no way that you could be feminine, no way that you can be attractive and smart at the same time. So if you're a woman, you can't have it all. They wanted me to dress down in business suits and to wear flats and to change who I was. I didn't, and it shocked them a lot. But that's the thing about being in an environment where people doubt you. Yes, there is a lot of negative self-talk that can happen within yourself, but you gotta look at the things that you can actually do. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I was qualified for the job, I had set those boundaries, and I can make it happen. Now, specifically women in the room, I know we have a long way to go. It is still 2019, and I think there was a report that just came out on Forbes where the title was, we have made groundbreaking history by there being 33 female CEOs of for Fortune 500 companies. This is supposed to be groundbreaking because now we make up 6.6% of all the CEOs. Now, regardless of how people identify, from a biological standpoint, there is only male and female. So marginally, the numbers should be 47, 53, not 6.6%. The men on the floor were great. They were mentors to me once I passed the exam. They wanted to help facilitate any and everything to boost my career. But it comes a point when there are people that want to be mentors, and then you achieve some type of success, and then they pull back. And that is what happens for a lot of women and why they don't get to climb up to CEO positions. For me, my journey was a little bit different. I made history and a year after I made history, BBC ran this story on me as being the only woman on the trading floor and that got a little press. And then I remember I went on a family vacation I was on a cruise, I was gone for 11 days, I came back, turned on my phone, and I was bombarded with text messages, voicemails, LinkedIn requests, I wasn't on social media at all at the time. CNBC had ran my story, and everything changed. My life from then on changed. I went from just being the girl at the New York Stock Exchange, to working at the New York Stock Exchange to being something else. From there on, I was asked to do my first speaking engagement. And I remember turning to the men on the floor to say, one, how much I should charge, and two, what do you think the topics I could speak on? Now this is where a fear-based mindset comes from people that don't want to see you do well. Meaning people will project their fears on you time and time again. But you know yourself better than anyone else, and if you feel like you can do it, you will. One of the men said to me, what could you possibly have to offer on a stage in front of people? Okay. Well, now I'm really going to do it. And it was terrifying because I was invited to speak in Toronto 
wasn't even America, in front of 20,000 people. And I said, this will either work or it won't. I did, and it was an amazing experience. And I went on to travel the world. And then I was asked by a studio, would you like to make a television series out of your life? Um, that's weird. <laughs> My life is pretty boring. I don't know what we could possibly write in a TV series. But ultimately end up choosing a movie. I have since left the trading floor and am now an author, an executive producer, a writer, TV, a model, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the thing that I love about Gen Zers that is just not specific to my story. They say, Gen Zers, that you all will be the generation with the largest entrepreneurs. Why? Because you guys are visionaries. You guys believe in your vision. And again, you guys are the generation that wants everything instantaneously. And I think mixed with that is why you guys have the drive to do anything and everything that you want to do at any point. So while the older generation may not understand why I left the trading floor, which, side note, if my life hadn't taken me where it has gone today, I would have left the trading floor regardless because, one, I don't know if many of the people in the room know this, but trading, honestly, is the dying field. The New York Stock Exchange is the only floor that has human traders. That is the reality. Technology is caught up, and there are algorithms and programs in place where you don't need human traders. That's one. Two, anybody under the age of 30 only stays on the trading floor for two years. They either love finance or they hate finance and they go on to do something else completely different. So everyone that I started with in 2017 has since left the trading floor. But I enjoy what I do. I enjoy having conversations around financial wellness, especially amongst women and minorities. And I want there to be others in the room not just working in a financial space, but I mean investing and investing now and continuously to invest. Also, I don't want to make it seem like just minority and women that I'm speaking to. The men in the room, the white men in the room, <laughs> I want you to know that there will be just as much hurdles in the, for you guys as well. You all will still be the others in the room just based off of your age. Especially if you're going into these corporations and especially if you're going onto Wall Street, a lot of the people that are CEOs of these companies that work the boards are older and they are not, not all of them, but they are not always open to new ideas. And so that in itself can be potentially a struggle, but I believe in there being conversation amongst both parties and being open to different visions. So if there is anything that you guys could take away from the speech tonight is one, to be curious, open to opportunities, visionaries, believe in yourselves, not having limiting beliefs, and you don't owe anyone an answer on why you're doing what you're doing. As long as you're having fun, you're enjoying it, and you're not in a place where you feel stuck. Because I have worked in a room with 250 men, and they have spent decades on the trading floor. And I will tell you that many of them wish that they had at least been open to different opportunities to even dip their toes into new things. So I want you all to have fun, have a purposeful driven life, to really go after whatever your dreams are, to be strategic and smart, and to network. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Echoing what Lauren, is the mic on? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Echoing what Lauren said, it's Monday, so thank you guys all for being here. Um, we're so grateful that you chose to be here tonight and hear her beautiful story. Um, I'm gonna start off, I had a question that I wanted to ask first, but as you spoke, I thought, well, maybe let's alter that first question. So our audience here, mostly majority college students, and you said in your speech that I studied my book cover to cover. Um, and so what did that look like for you? Like what strategy did you have specifically for studying this for this exam and um, for people who are gonna take the GRE, all these grad school exams, people are trying to go and take these exams, like what advice do you have for strategically planning it out studying for exams? Uh, exams, studying for it are never fun. <laughs> um, and I think each individual person is different as far as the strategies that they use to study. For me, I think I'm a combination student, so I can listen to audio. I can also use flashcards. I could also read notes. I could also am the student who will type out, like retype out what it says in a textbook. Um, and I could also highlight in a book. Uh, I know that some people just have a, a straight and narrow way of doing it, but I think it's, for me, it's whatever gets me in the zone to study at that moment, and that can look very different. Sometimes I don't have the concentration to read anything, uh, so doing audio is really good, and sometimes I can only read and making sure that the room is really quiet, and then other times studying um, amongst and a group of people can be beneficial, but I'm weird sometimes that that doesn't help me either. Uh, so it looks different for, for every person. But for me, with the book itself, I you know, studied it cover to cover. I, um, and I knew a lot of it fell on me. So yeah. Um, given that your uh, degree doesn't really re uh, like reflect you going into the New York Stock Exchange, what piece of advice do you have for someone pursuing a career that they don't necessarily, or are separate from their degree, um, and don't have the exact skills, technical skills for that position. Sorry. Uh, you know, I was saying earlier, if you, you're not always gonna have the technical skills, but transferable skills are always gonna be communication, uh, being really good at answering, sorry answering questions and being a good uh, interviewer. My mom, she worked in HR, so I was really prepared in that component. Um, but it's okay if you don't know the technical skills I, I said earlier, um, because if it's a job that really wants you to be there, they're going to train you. So never say no to an opportunity because you don't have a background in it. It's a reason why they are extending you the opportunity. Take it, learn, and again, nothing is concrete. If you don't love it, you don't have to stay with the company forever. Always give yourself anywhere between a year and two years because you don't wanna look like you're hopping throughout companies. Um, but I would never say no because you weren't trained in it. Stacy Cunningham, um, the female president of the New York Stock Exchange, she said that she was offered the job four times to be president. And she said no, and there is, I don't know what the, the statistics are, but often women, we do this, we will say no to an opportunity because we're not trained. Versus men, you guys are really good at just putting yourself out there and saying, I guess we'll figure it out. Uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, kind of to switch one of the conversations, one question that I had is, how do you feel right now? You just gave a really powerful speech you know, you're drinking some water. I'm almost halfway through mine. It's a little hot up here. How do you feel? I feel good. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, a little follow-up question is like, often we hear stories or read them or watch them or study them, especially as students being in college. Um, but with where you're at right now with, you know, being an author and being a director with your vision and, you know, making a movie and stuff like that, like, what is it like to be so transparent where the media is kind of all up in your business? It is something to get adjusted to because, I mean, again, I'm just this girl, just a small town girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm just this girl from Marietta, Georgia, and I 
don't really think my life is all that cool or interesting. And when people want to know miscellaneous things about what I ate for breakfast, mm. I always find that weird. Um, but I think the overall platform and the work that I'm doing is a way bigger cause than anything. And I really want finance to be the heart and the root. I mean, it will regardless. It is of any business organization. Um, but I want people to really continue to stay excited about it and not just men and specifically white men because that is the reason why Wall Street looks the way that it does today because people aren't exposed to it, they're unaware of it, finance isn't really talked about. And it's interesting because I think of um, women as a whole, they are the bookkeepers, they are the ones that are balancing the sheets in the house and they're the ones to least likely invest which is crazy. You know, one of, the, one of the things you mentioned early in your talk was the fact that you saw your life as kind of being the change, and part of that is kind of having this entrepreneurial spirit and uh, having in this force, but the underlying that is being curious and seeing opportunities. What are you curious about, and how do you notice this next thing that should be on your radar? The, the next thing is always what, cause, what, what induces fear, because, I say the biggest growth comes from taking the biggest risk. And if it's something that gives me the biggest fear, and especially if I have no background in it whatsoever, I will force myself to do it. Because why am I having these weird negative emotions around something that I have never put, my, put myself in? And so that's a lot of how things have been navigated. If I feel like it's too easy and I'm not going to learn anything from it or grow from it, I typically won't do it. So what's in that space for you right now? <laughs> I can't wait to tell you guys, but there is something that will come out next year, and we stay tuned. <laughs> Fair enough. I like that. I have um, a follow-up question to that. Um, so what recommendations um, can you give to both women and men pursuing careers, uh, pursuing their career, career from a faith base rather than fear? The universe has your back. I mean, the universe, God, what, however, whoever you want to call it, y you are exactly where you're meant to be. I genuinely, genuinely mean that. And while it may be a dark moment, Everyone goes through dark moments, but whatever your vision is, the universe's vision is significantly bigger. And while it may not be on your radar, that is completely okay. That's why I say continue to be open to opportunities because things are coming. And I don't believe in there being a rich and a poor. I believe that there is so much abundance in this world that everybody has the opportunity to be successful, to get their blessings, to get their deservings, and it is all there. To what you said earlier about there just being lots of women not really wanting to take risk as far as trading, um, what are some huge topics right now or trends that you see people are starting to invest in or what do you think people should invest in if women would try to start that trend? I can't say what women should invest in, but what I will say, um, you know, I do love platforms such as Elvest. Have any of you guys heard of Elvest in the room by a show of hands? Well, Elvest is a, is a woman um, investing platform such as Acorn and, and uh, all, the, all the others that I'm drawing a blank on. And they really help you pick something that is important to you. And so women... I don't think there's enough women investing. I My takeaway, I don't know if you were with me earlier, don't just invest in the stock market. Um, and th that's a whole thing, but you can definitely have a diverse portfolio. And also, you know, with the recession being on the horizon, don't be afraid to want to invest. Recessions are going to come. They're going to go. Things are going to be just fine. Um, but the earlier you start investing, the better. So to build on that point, um, 
in addition to that, you're very passionate around financial wellness. Um, these are all folks that are early in their horizon of being financially healthy. What would you say are some top things that individuals should think about to be financially well? A savings account. <laughs> um, I, I think just taking a portion out of your check is great. The earlier you start, the better. Then putting that money, I've mentioned CDs multiple times, but you can put your money into a savings account and it can grow interest, but putting your money into a CD account and then whatever the interest grows from your CD, which is uh, short term, after those, let's say, nine months or less than a year, whatever the interest that grew on that, putting that into a stock if you wanted to invest in the stock market and or putting that towards something else. Um, but I think people should be aware of credit. Don't know if that's talked about a lot. Learning how to save and really preparing for the future. At the same time, having fun, being young, um, I don't want people get to get too boggled down and saying, you know, I'm not going to buy coffee, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. Be financially aware of what is in what, how it's tailored to you and what that looks like for you because it's different for each individual and what their outside obligations are. Uh, but the minimum that you could do is have a savings account. Don't keep it in a checking account because checking accounts don't grow interest, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also building your credit, because that's important, at least in America. I had a kind of follow-up question as far as tailoring your house and being financially well. What does your mental health look like? Um, what kind of music do you listen to? What kind of stress-relieving activities do you partake in? So I am all about wellness and very mindful on of the things that I eat. I meditate every single day. I journal every single day. I also make it a point to laugh in the moments of stress. I'm very much a person, once I get into the zone, I'm completely in the zone and days can go by without me laughing. And as small as it seems to laugh, laughing is the biggest way to be present in the moment and enjoying what you're doing or enjoying that moment. Outside of that, I listen to a wide range of music. Um, Hip hop, R and B, Shawn Mendes, Ariana Grande. Uh, I, I listen to it all, and I work out. I work out a lot as well. And I'm from and 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 I'm from the <laughs> South, so I uh, I hike a lot. Um, I don't get to do it as much in New York because all the hiking is done in northern New York, which is super far. But uh, the mountains were my backyard, so I five minutes and I'm on a mountain trail. Um, can you talk about a time when you failed at something and what you learned from it? Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I learned on the floor, again, everything is done in microseconds, having accountability, but I think the biggest mistake, at least in my time on the trading floor, was that I made a $3 million error. And I remember it was the close of a Friday, and we weren't going to be able to correct that error into the following Monday. And just remember being stressed out and learning work-life balance and that no amount of stressing out was going to change what the outcome was going to look like on Monday. So again, being present in the moment, meditating, but also having accountability. When my boss came up to me and asked why did I make this mistake, there was nobody else that I could put the blame on but myself and whatever the consequences that were gonna come out of that was going to come. I don't know how many other settings you get to not place the blame on someone else, but definitely on the trading floor, everything is tracked back to that one individual person, and you can't hide behind anyone else. I kind of had a follow-up question. So we're talking about defining what are some of your greatest failures. What are some of your greatest accomplishments? I know with a lot of clubs here, especially BSA, we try to say that you are the accumulation of all your greatest achievements and not your failures. And so what is like a tradition that you practice that you, are, you take pride in or something that you, know, you feel is an achievement that might not get enough light? This is a tough question. <laughs> um, achievement that doesn't get enough light. I think, 
I do a lot of what I do because of my brother. Mm. I think I mentioned that earlier. Uh, my brother having cerebral palsy was an extrovert, larger than life personality and never looked at his disability as a disability. And a lot of the way that I live my life today as an abled body person, I have no excuses to not make something happen. If he can do it and if he can actually physically do it, he will. And even though he can't physically do things, he will still go out of his way to do things. There is no reason why I shouldn't. And so everything that I've accomplished, and it's not about making history, but just getting my job and being able to say that I'm writing a book and getting to explore new things, I look at that and I think, thank you, Lawrence, my brother, because he, he showed me that and he showed me to live life to the fullest. Mm-hmm. For those that are thinking about internships and professional pathways that might not have others like them in that um, entry level or mid level manager position, mm-hmm. what advice might you give to them? And then I have a second part to the question. If you could go back and look at the individuals on the floor um, and seeing that you're entering as others. What would be some practices or things that you think would have been really helpful for you to feel like you belonged to be a part of the floor culture and organization? Um, I'll answer the second question because I don't remember the first one, okay, so I'll go I'll back go to that. Um, I, I think it's a twofold. Again, how you perceive yourself, people are going to pick up on that. And if you come off timid and scared, and people will get that they will pick up on that energy. But also for people who are not the others in the room, I think it's important to, and, and Gen Zers are doing a great job at doing this, but to identify the others in the room and want to help them. Not look at them as different and, oh, I'm going to stay away, but wanting to help facilitate that change and how can we be a support system to them. I say Gen Zers are really good at that because you guys, they have thrown out these statistics for years that the more diverse the company is, the better their revenue is and the better their customers are and it's all a happy place. Um, And Gen Zers with these new companies that you guys are starting up, you guys are very much uh, about diversity and inclusion. Uh, who represents your company, and that is a direct reflection on your consumers and the people that uh, want to be involved with your company. Um, The older generation, I don't know. I don't know where the disconnect is, but if you are in a traditional Wall Street male-dominated environment and the ideologies are old, -er, I would definitely recommend embracing the others in the room because, you know, They're like that kid who sits alone at lunch. They need a friend and they need someone to lean on. So I definitely would extend that if you can. And what was the first question? Oh, just um, advice for individuals thinking of um, professions, industries that don't have a lot of your profile in them. What advice might you have to those individuals to take the bold step to network and pursue that? Yeah, opportunity. I would say your your network group should not just look like you. If it does, that's a problem. It you should definitely have people that look different. It is okay to have people that look different, and and that's not you know just to white people in the room. That's to black people in the room as well. Embrace this change. Have diversity, and also your job is not dependent. I said this earlier on how tall or short or fat or skinny or purple or orange or whatever you are. It's dependent on how well you can do in that job. So, with that being said, whatever baggage and limiting beliefs you have in your head has nothing to do with the job itself. You are there. You are giving an opportunity. Do well in your job, and you will be just fine. If you give yourself negative self-talk, you are going to create a reality that's not real. Yes, there is, you know, microaggressions that go on and uh, sexism and racism, et cetera, et cetera. But in my personal experience, I think all those 
not necessarily are brought onto ourselves, but sometimes we have to get out of the victim mentality and also step up to the plate as well. And I'm obviously speaking to the others in the room. And hopefully you understand what I'm saying by oh, that. Oh, no, yeah, I agree that there are, there are challenges that we are faced with sometimes that makes us feel as though we don't have opportunities or we don't have resources to reach out to. But I agree with the sentiment that we can pull ourselves up from these challenges and overcome them and be triumphant and face achievement instead of failure. Yep. Yes, and to what you're saying as well as far as like being able to accomplish whatever you want. I think, I believe that standing firm is, standing firm in whatever you're doing as well. So like you echoed that a lot in your speech as far as if you feel like you belong there, you're meant to be there, you're here for a reason. And that's like encouragement for anyone too. Um, as far as another question, how does your personal, what is something about your personal brand that you like and enjoy right now, whether that you like all of it as far as writing and authoring and being a model, but what is something that you really enjoy doing right now? Like part of my personal brand? Um, what do you mean? like? So you said you're now in this transition moving from trader, being a trader, and now you're in the light of I'm trying to build myself as a person, I'm doing movies, I'm an author, I'm a writer, I love to do these things, I like to give back to my community. What are aspects of that that you really enjoy? I think just using my platform uh, for the greater message, yeah, the media side is, is good and, and the attention is, is fine, but I think when you have a platform, regardless of what your brand and your platform is, using it for a better cause is good, and what is it that you represent? I really, really want the conversation of financial wellness to be a hot topic, and I want especially women and minorities to invest and understand the importance of that um, and if I could do that and help facilitate that in any way I feel like I have done my job awesome thank you so I look around this room and I'm sure everybody else up here can look around this room and see a bunch of goofy intelligent smart sexy human beings right <laughs> um, and Laura's not the exception. She is all of this, right? And so my question for you is, who do you surround yourself with? Like, what do your friend groups look like? I know my friend groups are pretty funny. You mm -hmm. surround yourself with funny people? No, I would say I'm the funniest. <laughs> no. I'm kidding. They you also mentioned your family and how your yeah. family is important. Who do you have as your circle of trusted advisors and people around you? Definitely my mom. She is not a, a yes person. Uh, she has always been tough. And I, I love her. Um, it, tough because she's always wanted more and always expected more. And, and I, I love that. Um, but she's not a yes person to the sense of, okay, you did a good job. Here's a pat on the back. She's always pushed me to more greatness. And uh, I really appreciate that. Um, because you don't always need yes people in your life. Yes, people in your life is how you think you can get away with things when you shouldn't. And you need to have those checks and balances of people who want to see you do well, will hold you accountable, will tell you no, that's not a great idea. Um, and I really appreciate my mom for that. My friends, um, you know, I did grow up in Marietta, Georgia, and so a lot of my friends still live in Georgia, and, and that's fine. Um, but, you know, I, I do, you know, wish people would get out of their comfort zone. And it's not just my friends. I, I know a lot of people who graduated college, and, and maybe even like yourself, um, just stay in the same area, and they never really fully take on life and explore. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, your mindset can be a little jaded mm -hmm. In, in kind of the same mentality of what your community is like. So. What are some places you travel to then? Uh, well, uh, I've been everywhere. I mean, not everywhere, but the, the past year I've, I've been to Ireland, Beijing, Dubai, Paris. Um, 
and Grand Cayman. Um, I think next year I'm going to Singapore. I mean, I've, I've got to, to travel and to really meet different cultures and different people and to go into the mindset of how they work and how they look at life. And I think it just makes you a more well-rounded person. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to go out and travel the world, uh, but definitely getting outside of your city and your own community, I think is great, even if that means just going one state over. Um, do you mind speaking a little bit about your book, how you decided that um, that's kind of the next thing that you wanted to do and what you're hoping your readers can take away from reading your book? Yeah, so I decided to write the book. The, the movie is more or less a biopic, and uh, the question I get asked all the time, well, how did you make this, this big leap? And yeah, I speak to you guys a little bit about being 21 and I needed a job, et cetera, et cetera. But it also, again, has everything to do with your belief system and your mindset. And I really, hopefully people can use the, the tools and practices that I used and be able to recreate them, create that yourselves. And it doesn't, it's not black and white, so not everything is gonna be, if I do one, two, three, four, this is what's gonna happen. But hopefully you can take some of the tools that I use to help uh, do that. So the book definitely is around financial wellness, the power in the mind, and just, you know, taking risk. You're dynamic. I don't know uh, what you guys think, but you're really dynamic. I don't know if anybody <laughs> told you that. Um, what are you, what are, what are five things right now off the top of your head that you just can't live without? Like me, if anybody know me, I can't live without my game. I gotta play my game. Um, but like, with stuff along that line. Uh, my dog Casper, he's amazing. He's a little Maltese. Um, I my phone because I call my mom all the time. Um, what else? I don't know. I'm a pretty simple person. That uh, I can't live without. Can't live without these things. I mean, like food and water. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, um, what can't you live without following in terms of news information, things that you're following? Well, or? I will say every morning I wake up and my friends get a little annoyed. Uh, every morning I wake up, the first thing I do, I don't get on Instagram, but again, social media was never a thing for me and it's only become a thing because they say that's what you need to do. But every morning I get on uh, CNN, Fox News, and CNBC but that's because I'm a finance person. I love seeing what's going on in the market um, or reading in the news that Kylie Jenner just sold a $600 million stake within her company. Yo, for 51%. Uh, yeah. Like, that was crazy. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, no, that was crazy. Um, <laughs> the impeachment trials is interesting and seeing the different perspectives from Fox News and CNN, um, which all is correlated to the market. Um, so that's usually how I start my day and, and what I have to read every morning and every night. And, you know, I don't follow sports at all, but on s yesterday, Today's Monday. Yesterday, I heard about the Colin Kaepernick thing and thought that was the craziest thing ever, and he's lost his mind, but best of luck to him. Um, but things like that, you you get to keep up on trends and what's going on, and and that's how I start my morning. Mm. Um, going back to something that you mentioned earlier, how important your network is, but then you also mentioned how after um, college you kind of reflected and noticed that you didn't um, utilize your network as much, but, um, and didn't have that big of a network. How did you, um, like kickstart networking? What did that look like? Um, how did you reach out to people? What platforms did you use? So, uh, yeah, when I graduated college, I, I, again, I, a little bit is repeated from what I said earlier, but this for the people that weren't in the room, I was, um, really frustrated that my family hadn't gone along further in life where I, why couldn't I just get into these companies <laughs> uh, through their connections? And after having that woe is me victim mentality and getting all the anger out towards my family, I had to realize, I had to pull up my big girl panties and say, I have to make this happen. 
myself. And regardless of the cards that you are given in life, I truly believe that you can make it happen if you will. Um, so now working for me, yes, I spoke. I reached out to CEOs of companies. I did the 30-day free trial on LinkedIn because I was a broke college student. And those 30 days, I reached out to CEOs, C-suite executives, and anybody and everybody who could talk to me. And, you know, I wrote some generic email, can we do coffee, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I put it in a spreadsheet of who I, Excel sheet of who I had spoken to. And the worst thing that you could be told is no. Mm. That's it. And that's no, no is no. And that's fine. A missed opportunity for them, I guess. Um, and, and that's it. I mean, there, I would say LinkedIn, especially on the business platform side, is going to be your best way to go. And they are actively, the majority of them are on there. I would not suggest, again, speaking to people entry level. They just don't have that power and that control to help you get into the company. They could give you insight, but you really want to surround yourself around people who will really be able to facilitate the change. And again, it's okay if people tell you no. It's okay if people don't respond. Um, I always took it personal, and if it was one advice that I could give to myself two years, three years ago, it's okay if people don't respond. It has nothing to do with you. They don't know you. People are busy in their adult lives, and they are doing 101 other things, as I've learned. And if they don't respond to you, that's okay. And again, I also am a true believer that that opportunity wasn't for you. There will be another opportunity that will come along. But I really do think LinkedIn will be your best friend. Going off what you said earlier, you said that um, you would be a huge advocate of just showing up at a place because, you know, people get a lot of emails all day. Have you ever just showed up at a company and how did that go out for you? You know, I've heard people doing that and I think that's so ballsy, but also at the same time, I mean, you we've seen it in Hollywood movies. I, I'm, I want to interview and they sit in the lobby for five hours. I'm sure that probably works. I've never done that. But I think, you know, taking risk, it may seem crazy to me. It may seem completely awesome to a CEO of a company that you were willing to do that. I don't know how often people are stepping out of their comfort zone to really want to take the charge and to really do something. So if it makes sense to you and it's not illegal, I say do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting close to the end of our time together, so uh, do we have any other? I mean, I have one question. I have one Go more ahead, question. Yeah. It's small, it's simple. I mean, you're really passionate about a lot of things. You're really passionate about a lot of things, from your brother to your family to your craft that you are perfecting every single day. Mm -hmm. um, and how does that all fit into what I'm about to ask? But aren't you a little bit passionate about climate change, too, from what we <laughs> talked about? Yes. <laughs> um, you know, it. it's interesting because we, millennials, Gen Zers, we care about it so much. And for some reason, older people don't. And I don't understand, again, where the disconnect comes. But this is where I'm talking about the innovation, the visionaries, and how we're going to step in place and take charge, and how it's not gonna take us 50 years to figure out a game plan. We're gonna do it, we are doing it, and so I won't even say baby steps. I, I think within, honestly, within the next decade, we are gonna definitely have facilitated change, and it's gonna be completely, uh, has nothing to do with the boomers, honestly. And we, we are really good at, at not needing gatekeepers. And if they don't want to do it, we will. We will figure it out a way, and we will make it happen. This is an activist, y'all. She is an activist, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Mari, you said you had a question? Oh, go ahead. Do you have a question? Oh, no. Um, go ahead. Okay. Well, I just wanted to um, close as I, the one thing that strikes me is that you're kind of a very Renaissance person, liber, liber, living a true liberal arts kind of spirited life. So to the audience who um, are here at two liberal arts institutions, both the students as well as lifelong learners for those that are in our community here tonight, what advice might you have as they continue to build their life journey um, to ex expand their perspectives, think about doing, studying, learning different things? 
uh, that they can piece together to have an interesting life. I'm sure you guys have heard this, but keep learning. Keep learning and growing. There should never be a point where you should be stagnant or feel like you know any and everything. First of all, do you really want to be the person that knows any and everything? No, I don't think so. For me, as you go through your career or even the, the, the courses that you're studying, um, I always like being the dumbest person in the room, if that makes sense, because there's a lot of chance for me to grow and to learn. And if you're constantly in a place and in that place, you are doing so. So be open to exploring new things. You have a long life to live. And be open to opportunities, continue to learn, and explore things that you never thought interest you. And take that risk, right? Take that risk. Of Bet course. It all. People. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much for being here tonight. On behalf of the McCarthy Center and all the sponsors of tonight's evening, we really thank Lauren for being here to share her wit wisdom of being other in the room. Watch for her book coming out in the next year or so, and we'll be following you on all your new um, platforms of sharing your perspectives, particularly in the area of financial wellness. Have a great evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight.